Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 865th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a Programs Associate here at the Rail, and today I have the huge pleasure and privilege of being your MC for a conversation featuring Hungwei Bao, D.E. Megenthaler, and Paul Gladstone. We're also thrilled to welcome poet Sahar Krebani here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guests and host. Dr. Hungwei Bao is Associate Professor in Media Studies at the University of Nottingham, UK. He's the author of numerous publications, most recently Contemporary Chinese Queer Performance, and is the co-editor of the Contemporary of Contemporary Queer Chinese Art. He serves on numerous editorial boards and co-edits Oyster, Feminist and Queer Approaches to Art to Arts cultures and genders, and queering China, transnational genders and sexualities. D.E. Megenthaler is a PhD candidate at the Institute of Art History at the University of Zurich. She obtained her MA in uh, Art Gallery and Museum Studies with distinction at the University of Leeds in 2017. Her current research project investigates queer artworks created by artists, activists, curators, and critics in mainland China and the Chinese diaspora in Europe from the 1980s to the present. She is also a co-editor of the publication Contemporary Queer Chinese Art. And award-winning critical theorist and cultural historian Paul Gladstone is the Judith Nielsen Chair Professor of Contemporary Art at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, and a distinguished affiliate fellow of the UK China um, Humanities Alliance at Tsinghua University. He is co editor of the book series Contemporary East Asian Visual Studies, Societies, and Politics, and was founding principal editor of the Journal of Contemporary Chinese Art. His recent publications include the collected edition, Visual Culture Wars at the Border of Contemporary China from 2021. Uh, it's such an honor to have you all here to discuss this amazing new book. Um, and with that, I'll pass it over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Um, I just also like to um, give an acknowledgement. I'm speaking from Hobart in Tasmania, right at the kind of southern end of, of uh, Australia. And I'm speaking from Nipaluna land, um, and land which um, uh, is associated with the Muinina nation. So I'd like to pay uh, an acknowledgement to all elders past, present and emerging, and acknowledge that sovereignty over this land was never ceded. I'd also like, before I move on to our um, wonderful panel tonight. I'd just like to pay a tribute to Eleanor and Chloe and all the others at uh, Brooklyn Rail. I've been doing this for quite a while with the Brooklyn Rail and um, they are an absolutely sterling team, hugely professional, very organized and uh, very responsive to, to the kinds of things that we do online. So thanks go out to you guys. I'm very, uh, I'm very pleased tonight. Uh, well, actually it's morning for me. Um, but on a Tuesday, um, but I'm very pleased to uh, introduce um, uh, a couple of wonderful people and somebody else in absentia who have been responsible for co-editing this, what I think is a landmark book, Contemporary Queer Chinese Art. So Hongwei and uh, Di uh, are with us tonight. Uh, Jamie, the third co-editor, can't be with us tonight for, for family reasons. But I just say to Jamie, if you're watching the recording of this, you're much missed and um, many congratulations for, for being one of the co-editors of the book. Why is this important? Well, um, much has been written, much ink has been spilt on the subject of Chinese art and uh, Chinese contemporary art. And within that existing writing, there are, um, are mentions 
<clears throat> discussions of artists who may fit into the category of queer. However, an explicit discussion and a concentrated discussion of the subject is only now emerging, and particularly with this book um, co-edited by our guests. This is, it's very important, obviously, to, um, to um, listen to the voices that are, are being put forward in the book and the subject matter of the book. It's part of the diversity of contemporary art internationally, but I think it also deals with very specific issues around the question of, of queer and its relationship to society and culture and politics inside and outside China. Um, so I think we're going to have a great discussion this evening. There's some really kind of meaty and interesting topics to discuss. But before we go any further, um, Hong Wei and with the assistance of Dee are going to make a short presentation about the book, and then we'll get into some questions about some of the themes that are raised in the presentation. So uh, thanks, guys. Over to you, Hong Wei. Uh, thank you, Paul, for your kind introduction, and thank the Brooklyn Rail for providing this great opportunity for us to talk about the book. So I'll show the book and then I'll share the slides. So in this small talk, short talk about 10 minutes, Dee and I will probably talk about our process of editing the book as well as our editorial decisions or concepts of putting the book chapters together. So uh, a brief introduction, me as Eleanor has just introduced. So I'm a queer Chinese researcher. My research expertise is on queer Chinese history and culture. So in a way that's not a very difficult job because uh, the visible forms of queer culture only started to emerge from the 1990s onwards. And before that, most people in China didn't even know what being gay or lesbian is, how, was from the 1990s. I mean, there were several landmark events. For example, 1997, homosexuality was decriminalized from the criminal, uh, from the criminal law. So that is very important landmark. And in 2001, homosexuality was, was removed from the national classification of uh, mental disease. So this marked a kind of partial depathologization. So with this, an urban queer communities started to emerge. And of course, I mean, this only had a history of the past 30 years, but the history of the past 30 years was amazing. I mean, Chinese queer activism and culture has pretty much, in a way, developed in a speed that even impressed or surprised me as a researcher myself. I remember when I was attending university in Beijing in the early 2000s, I first heard of the term gay or comrades at that time. So I, it was a, a, a big revelation to me and people around me may not uh, might have not, never heard about it and they were discussing what is this and so on. And yet in 10 years time, many LGBTQ organizations were set up in the country including the Beijing LGBT Center, Beijing Queer Film Festival, Shanghai Pride and so on and so forth. So it seemed that the queer community was booming and they were developing rapidly. But into the 2010s, especially during the past five years or seven years, LGBT organizations were rapidly shut down by the government. I mean, and a lot of queer organizing were either banned and queer content was censored. So this was a big shift in a mere 30 years. So I'm having two images here. The image on the left is a Shanghai Pride in the 2020. It was the last Shanghai Pride before it's been closed down. And then the picture on the right is Beijing LGBT Center, which was closed down earlier this year. So what's so interesting is that during such a short span of time, queer communities and cultures have developed rapidly, but with great obstacles. 
And exactly because this particular political, social, and cultural context have shaped amazing piece of artwork. For example, Xia Die's paper cuts. The paper cutting is a traditional Chinese cultural form. Xia uh, Die, uh, uh, the uh, 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 artist, uses paper cutting as a form to express homoeroticism. And then there's also the photo photograph and installation by Shi Tou, which explores female same-sex intimacy and which draws on the kind of Republican era or early 20th century poster work. And you also have well, diaspora Chinese artist, for example, uh, Whiskey Chow's uh, video art, which explores diaspora queer belongings and how it diverges from a hegemonic notion of Chineseness and queerness. So these are all fascinating work, but to date, uh, before our book, there had not been a monograph or detailed study of contemporary queer Chinese art. So this book fills this particular academic gap. So our aim of putting together the book were particular, particularly, well, very ambitious. And now it seems that a lot of them may not have been delivered, but uh, that was a purpose. So there wasn't a queer art history. So this is a step of documenting a queer art history. There hasn't been a queer art a Chinese queer art archive. So we're trying to use the book, especially the images in the book. The book contains about 18, uh, 80 images. So that is, it can be considered to be an exhibition of Chinese queer art. We're also thinking about uh, how to add queer voices to contemporary Chinese art. As Paul has just mentioned, there has been loads of publications about queer uh, contemporary art, but not many focusing on queer issues. We're all also thinking about uh, queer art history in a global context, most of them center on Euro and American voices and how to actually add Chinese voices and non-Western voices to this debate. I think these are multiple strengths that we're grappling with. And of course, we may have addressed some more uh, substantially than others. So what happened next is I'm going to ask Dee to talk about the start of the project. We started the project three years ago with a workshop. So Dee, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hongwei, for introducing the, a little bit of the history of the queer arts and the, and the LGBT rights movement in, in, in China. And hi, I'm Dee. And first of all, I would also like to thank you so much for the Brooklyn Rails and to um, for organizing this event and also for inviting me to this conversation. And I would like to talk a little bit about myself and the project related to this book. I come from Guangzhou, the southern part of China, and I was trained as a painter in my high school and my undergraduate studies in Chinese painting at Guangzhou Academy of Fine Arts. Career friendship and romantic relationship was not a foreign concept to me in the very beginning, but it is part of my kind of everyday social life and it is in my friend zone as well. So it was in 2013 when I learned about the definition of queer um, from my friend Joe, and who was then an activist member in Rainbow Group at the Sun Yat-sen University, also in Guangzhou. But although I and my, my friends and I study art in academy, but we as students do not have or do not dare to have the idea to put the career queerness or queer sensibility to our coursework because back then the principle was still dominated by socialist realism. So when I noticed the term queer 
chi Chinese queer artist. It was um, 2017 when Ren Han's um, death was kind of the news about Ren Han's death spread all around the internet. And therefore, I would like to take the chance when I when I have it um, to propose a PhD project in art history studies. And I choose this topic to reflect on the queer perspectives and its impact on individuals who are pursuing artists career and how do they work um, with these concepts with the media. And from 2019 to 2021, many art projects were canceled due to the COVID-19 lockdowns and also social restriction pol policy policies. And I could not visit the artists in person in China. So in December 2020, I invite my colleagues to apply for two fundings at the University of Zurich with me. And in May 2021, we organized a bilingual Zoom workshop titled The Queering, Queering the Boundary of the Arts in the Sinosphere. And this image we're looking at, it is a workshop's poster designed by artist Wei Mu. It is a watercolor painting. And as we can see in the center of this poster, um, there is a very attractive gender, gender fluid person sitting on the picnic blanket. <laughs> and this person holds a kite, um, which looks like a combination of a butterfly and the eyes and the penis. And we can also see uh, a rainbow clock on the left and a rainbow in the sky. And behind are uh, the mountains that looks like those in freehand brush style Chinese painting. Wei actually makes other poster drafts as well, but we as organizers and speakers chose this one because it expressed our envisioning of the workshop as a joyful catch up with one another as um, artists, curators, scholars, and, and writers who have been working on a very similar theme and about queer self-expressions uh, and about uh, LGBTQ rights practices for quite some years. And the workshop is also a networking event between the older and younger generations of cultural actors in the field. Our speakers um, grow up in mainland China, and most of them come from smaller towns instead of big cities. And they also, uh, some of them, they already um, relocated in Europe, um, like Hongwei, artist Park Fan Po Po, and some of them, they are based in Japan, and, and such as, um, Mayan home and the scholar Dian Dian is in US. So to speak, the workshop is um, cross-disciplinary, cross cross-generational and transgeography by nature. And it contains uh, five panels. The first one examines the overlaps between queer performance art and activism. And the second panel provides insight into the artists and curators working methods and the medium and materiality. And the third panel discusses about um, the queer readings and writings. For instance, my friend Jo shared her use of um, scholar Josephine Ho's theory of modularization to read the feminist and queer potential queer political messages in the slash fiction. Hong Wei and Dian Dian discussed um, the importance of queer, Chinese queer turn um, to actually make space for Chinese LGBTQ people to come together and to configure a self-affirmative gender and sexual uh, identity. 
And in the fourth panel, artist Ma Yanhong, Li Xingmo, and curator Zhen Shi um, discuss how they engage a uh, female experience and feminist reading of queerness in their art practices and curatorial practices. And in the last panel, um, we actually discussed the uh, Zeng Bu Rong and Er Gao's performance artworks, focusing on the queer potentials of performance art to use the embodied knowledge to invite audiences and um, spectators to reflect on the meaning of lifetime in state narratives. Um, many wonderful outcomes of this workshop are incorporated into the book. And thanks again for Hong, uh, to Hongwei for inviting me to be part of the editorial team. And now I'm handing over to you and to talk about the structure of the book. Yeah, thank you, Dee, for introducing the workshop. The workshop was great. I attended the workshop as a speaker. And I felt that such a project is, is definitely needed. But of course, it takes a lot of time and efforts to translate a workshop into a book. So this is what uh, we have been doing. So after the workshop, we sent all the speakers invitation to contribute to our edited volume. But of course, not everybody was able to well, meet the deadline or was able, uh, able to contribute to the volume. So we received about 10 to 12 chapters from uh, symposium participants. But we also invited some, uh, some contributions. For example, we felt that the uh, topic of curation, especially queer curating and feminist curating, needs to be in the book. So we invited contribution on those topics. We also strengthened the trans theme uh, uh, to touch on the uh, importance of trans art in China. And as well, we also focused on the neurodiversity, the intersection between neurodiversity and queerness. So altogether, we have uh, about 15 chapters uh, written by 16 authors. And well, the book is a richly illustrated book, as I have shown. So we have discussed with a publisher who is very supportive. We have also secured some publishing grants from the universities to support the color printing. So I pretty much treat the book as a kind of uh, as a coffee table book, which is really nice to look at and to pick up. But this book actually also aims to bridge the gap between the academia and the art world between activism and academia. So in a way, we put different people's works together. For example, we uh, uh, juxtapose uh, artists with curators' work and with uh, activists' work and with scholars' work. We deliberately blur the boundaries and challenge the boundaries, the well perceived boundaries between those those kind of arts and professions, etc. So uh, we are also very fortunate to have all the copyright permissions from the artist, and in particular, artist Shito kindly gave us permission to use her photograph from her water, underwater series. And uh, I would just to say that the book project, well, in a way, we had more difficulty with a book project because of the global pandemic. So the book project pretty much started, or even the workshop pretty much started during the pandemic. And then we were not able to bring authors together and some authors were originally ready to contribute, but because of their house or family reasons, they couldn't contribute their chapters in the end. So we acknowledge the kind of impact of the global pandemic that has brought to everyone, and in particular to artists who mostly live a very precarious way of life. And the global pandemic also has 
some silver linings, which, which was that we were able to pay attention to some contemporary issues, such as the pandemic politics, the kind of global geopolitics, anti-Asian racism, and anti-racist uh, organizations that only emerged or, or that were only accentuated in recent years. So you will see that many chapters, some directly dealt with the issue of the pandemic, some artists such as uh, Zeng Burong and Fan Po Po created artwork in response to the pandemic. And other artists actually were responded to the pandemic environment in different ways. For example, the first uh, uh, women's arts festival was held in Beijing during the pandemic. And it wasn't easy, but the curators have developed interesting and flexible curatorial strategies. So definitely this background of the global pandemic has shaped this book in more ways than we had originally anticipated. So our central question for the book is what's queer about queer Chinese art? So of course, I mean, you can have many answers to these questions, but we're essentially thinking about what our book enables us to have a conversation with contemporary Chinese art or with the study of global queer art. So one thing that we're going to suggest is that queer Chinese art does not center around LGBTQ plus identities. In fact, if you ask most artists and curators actually in this book, whether they identify as queer, or whether they identify as trans or feminist, and a lot of them would probably say no, or they were not sure, or uh, they would, uh, well, for the reason of safety, so they would, they would refuse to answer this question. So this is very interesting because queer art in the West is pretty much conceived to be the kind of artistic expression of the LGBTQ plus communities, et cetera. And in China, this is also the case, but it's more complex. So queer becomes kind of rallying point for all those, you know, people who advocate freedom of life, advocate the kind of freedom of expressions of gender and sexualities, whatever their identity is, uh, whichever they identify. So queer really becomes this umbrella that brings people together instead of separating people from one group to the other. So that's one important discovery. And the other important discovery is queer Chinese art is not obsessed with what's Chineseness. So for uh, the book proposal, actually, one of the uh, book reviewers actually asked us the question, what's Chinese about this book? What's Chinese about queer chi Chinese art? And we were originally actually surprised because we didn't know how to answer this question. But then we realized actually in the kind of art history, there is a perception about what Chinese art should be. Presumably you should be using some kind of Chinese signs and symbols, etc. But not every artist, not every artwork actually utilizes those symbols. And some, when they use them, they deliberately, you know, subverse them, challenge them. And we think this is also quite interesting. And there are some artworks actually, you cannot tell whether they are from China or whether they are from Europe, etc. So this is also quite interesting. And for us, it's really, it really demonstrates this potential of, you know, disrupting the fixed boundaries of whether national boundaries or kind of gender sexual boundaries, etc. And this seems to us to be very important actually in understanding contemporary Chinese art. So what contemporary Chinese art should be and can be. It can be everything and anything which does not have to fall into the stereotypes of people's expectations or the kind of you know, positioning of Chinese art in an international art market. But of course, when talking about art and some uh, readers also ask, well, are you really talking about art? What are some of the uh, works that you're discussing were actually performance. Some of them were actually street activism. How artistic are they? 
and we suggest that we should actually really think about in a broad manner. So as a self-expression, as a type of technology of the self, as a kind of social activism, as an assemblage of different affects, etc. So really, art shouldn't be seen simply as pretty pictures or paintings, etc. I know that I'm talking about something obvious on this forum, but these were the common questions that we encountered okay. from, from some readers and from the reviewers. So queer Chinese art challenges what is Chinese art and what is queer art. So in a way, it queers Chinese art, the study of Chinese art, and also de-westernizes or decolonizes the kind of queer art history. It challenges some received wisdom of what queer art should be and what, you know, what kind of themes or expressions they should pick up. One simple uh, example is that very few people would think about traditional craft of paper cutting uh, as a form of queer art. But in Tia Dia's works, we can see that it's, it's, it's very queer. So really queerness is about the self-expression. Uh, it is also about the kind of audience reception, like what kind of queer readings, what kind of queer sentiments or sensibilities has it conjured up on the part of the audiences. So the book uh, structure uh, differs slightly from the kind of workshop structure. So we decided to focus on four aspects. The first aspect, we focus on the kind of objects, materials, and forms of artworks. This is because, I mean, from the kind of cultural analysis background that I come from, so a lot of attention has been focused on representation, what's in the artworks, what do they signify. But what's interesting about these artworks is that they really suggest that we pay attention to issues of materiality, to issues of access, to issues of production, to issues of labor, and so on. So we hope that through the first three chapters, uh, we are able to point to the importance of objects and materiality and forms. And in the second part, we highlight the importance of feminine feminist interventions. So we have feminist artists who talk about their feminist activism and artwork. So uh, in particular, chapter eight, uh, written by a feminist, art, a feminist artist and activist Wei Tingting, talks about their social interventions in, for example, in subway stations, on Chinese streets, etc., oh, which were extremely courageous, uh, courageous given the current police, political atmosphere in China today. And then the third part, we're focusing on curation. So curation is important. So what kind of art is considered to be queer art, feminist art, and trans art is, of course, um, uh, 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 deeply related to, for example, the politics of visuality and the politics of positionality. We are also interested in those kind of different inter interpretive frameworks of artworks. For example, Fen Ma Liu Ming was previously actually known as a Chinese avant-garde artist or contemporary artist, a performance artist. But it was only in recent years that uh, their works was seen actually from the framework of transgender. So that is quite interesting. So that probably suggests that uh, the discursive frameworks and social contexts have a big role to play in how we understand queer uh, trans and feminist art. And the last part deal with queer Chinese art in a transnational diaspora context. So in which uh, Zheng Burong, who is uh, London-based, and Fan Po Po, who is currently Berlin-based, they're talking about their artwork in response to contemporary issues such as anti-Asian racism, such as the kind of stereotypes about Chinese and Chinese-ness and so on. So in the last chapter, I talk about a great art project called Imagining Queer Bandung, in which queer 
queer people of color in Berlin gather together and create artworks and films, etc. And they are drawing on this kind of historical discourse abandon and gave it new meanings to articulate a type of queer of color solidarity. So in this sense, actually, queer Chinese art in a way makes active in a way, connections with other social groups, with other types of politics, and they, in a way, demonstrate their contemporary relevance with our world today. So, and of course, I mean, we have lots of people to thank, and including Professor Paul Glaston, who is here today, and Professor Xin Huang today, who is also here, who have kindly uh, uh, written uh, uh, generous comments for the books, uh, for the book. We also thank all the, of course, first of all, all the contrib contributing authors. It's, it's a challenge, actually, to work across language and many chapters were first uh, uh, in a way written in Chinese and translated into English and thank D and other translators. We have also transcribed some uh, artist talks, uh, online talks verbatim. So essentially we are trying to preserve this kind of intimate and personal feeling of the conversation in order to make this book more reader friendly. So although this is an academic book, but uh, I can see that this book will be uh, hopefully be read by people who are interested in art, in China, in queerness, among others. So, and of course, we are currently editing more books on uh, Chinese queer culture, including a forthcoming uh, edited volume on uh, Ch Chinese queer literature and another book on Chinese uh, feminist activism. So stay tuned. So that's all for our talk. Thanks very much. Thank you, <clears throat> Hong Wei Di. I think that's extremely helpful in giving an overview of the book and, and some of its key themes. Um, as, as usual, we don't have a huge limitless amount of time for, for our panel today, but I'd, I'd just like to kick off with three lines of questioning before we go to the audience Q&A. Um, Hongwei quite rightly pointed out that the, the, the development of a public queer community, LGBTQI plus communities, is really a relatively recent thing in mainland China. Um, probably over the last couple of three decades um, within the context that Hong Wei described. I think maybe, maybe two points to make, and, and one will turn into a question. Uh, of course, uh, queer identities or, or lived queer lives and lived LGBTQI plus lives existed before the turn of the millennium in China. Um, one can find examples of sort of merging identities like that as part of Chinese modernity in the 1920s and 30s, but under different conditions, not defined by the discourses that we understand to surround those identities now. And also um, within contexts which often suppress the visibility, the public visibility of those things. I think what Hong Wei was referring to, uh, which is very important to understand, is that there was a time or has been a time of visibility for queer and LGBTQI communities in China um, during a kind of relative a period of relative liberalization from the end of the 20th century through to about, to about 2012 when Xi Jinping became president of, uh, of, uh, of the PRC. And it's really after Xi Jinping comes into power with his brand, of growing brand of neo-Confucian nationalism, that there is the suppression of those identities that um, organizations and institutions um, get closed down. Is that right to say, Di and Hong Wei? Is that yes. a kind of good summation of the history? And the important thing being there is, is that visibility, public visibility, is a key issue in China. It's a key issue elsewhere, but it really is key politically, what can be seen and what cannot be seen. And I think, I, I think we'd be right in saying that the public visibility of queer communities is now being 
pushed back by the general political conditions within the PRC. Is that right to say? Yes. So I, I, I think one could take heart by saying that, you know, diversity and, and, and queer identities have existed historically in China, but they're subject, as, as they are everywhere else, to shifting political conditions. One thing that I think is really important, this is a question <laughs> to both of you, which is about this definition of queerness, which I think is fascinating. I, I think it's very interesting that you're distinguishing between queerness and LGBTQ identities, or at least public acceptance or admission of living those identities, particularly in China. Maybe you could expand on that. And also, are there limitations to queer? I mean, you seem to be using it as a very capacious term to define maybe some alternative or um, a, a bleak difference to um, authority here. But, you know, what stops just about anybody being queer under this definition? I mean, do you have kind of thoughts about that? Where are the limits and what are the differences between lesbian and gay and, and, and other often described as queer identities within Western context? So either of you really. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you want to come, uh, give it a go? Okay. Um, I think for the first question, it's about the LGBTQ identities. Um, and actually, in Chinese uh, language, we have the term uh, which is um, referring to um, the art, a gay art, or um, the arts that um, try to establish um, homo normative, uh, same sex normativity um, politics. And the other term is queer art and is a core issue. So this refers to um, the queer politics um, more specifically and address it, and it address um, the artworks that um, comes from the more marginalized positions within the LGBTQ identity politics. Um, and, and these two um, tendencies are both including uh, in the, if, we emerge, if we imagine the queer art as a bigger category, and, and these two tendencies are both in, inside this. And, they are kind of entangling to, together in some, in some part of it. And um, for, for us, we can talk is about the nuances between the different uh, positionalities. This is what I think that we try to illustrate in this book and how the artists, they situate themselves in the art world, in nature, in consumer culture, in the art market. And the other things um, is it's like um, it's like the the, um, the the question about are there there are the limitation queer and I think um, although queer art is about um, the fluid boundaries and, and stressing on the point like decentering the narrative. So there are um, certain limitations like we are not um, taking the norm as self-evident, self self-evident, sorry, self-evident and, and we, are, we are trying to critically thinking about the the categorizations and and this can be um, can be positioning in the context of gender fluidity of uh, sexuality diversity but it also moves uh, beyond this topic and kind of expanding from the anthropocentric positioning and extending to the queer ways of thinking reflecting on how we as humans situating ourselves um, inter 
relating and connecting to the categorization of the things, of beings, and of the a bigger society in the world. And this is my answer. No, that's pretty good. Thank you very much. Do, do you want to add anything to that, Hongwei? Uh, sure, sure. So I think that I'll probably just uh, uh, highlight what uh, uh, Di has said, which is that in China, there has not been a fixed term for uh, gender sexual minorities. You have Tongzhi, you have LGBTQ, you have gay and lesbian, you have local terms such as Piao Piao, La La, and so on and so forth. And I do not see them as kind of linguistic games. So they are terms with their histories, with their contexts, and those histories, those contexts were in a way actually actually suggest a different types of subjectivities shaped by particular histories and particular power relations. So when we're talking about queer, it is more used as a gesture or as a stance to differentiate themselves from more, you know, other types of art forms or other types of identities. For example, if there is Tongzhi identity, which leans more on the kind of identity expressions, then queerness actually tries to differentiate itself from the kind of identity politics that Tongzhi art articulates and try to, in a way, embrace a gender sexual diversity and fluidity. So that's the first question. And then, of course, in queerness in this book, and of course in China, contemporary China is understood in different ways. So for some, it's a kind of non-normative or anti-normative stance. It's against China's one-child policies, against the kind of or the compulsion to uh, uh, to get ma had, uh, married heterosexually, and so on. So in particular, in in China. At this stage, it's very difficult to be single. It's very diff difficult to be non heterosexual. So, queerness was more used as a stance against those state discourses of family, marriage, and kinship, etc. But for people in the queer community, they also understand queer in different ways. For example, some see queer as an expression of themselves. Other people see queer as a kind of social relations that connects themselves with other people in the community. While other people see queer as a kind of expressions of intimacy that does not have to actually be defined by identity categories. What I'll also say is that, uh, of course, I mean, queer, well, well, as he tried to articulate a kind of, in a way, subversive and non-hegemonic, non-normative politics, sometimes it can also be co-opted by different hegemonic discourses, such as nationalism, such as consumerism, such as uh, 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 capitalism. For, ex for example, now in Beijing, uh, in big cities, such as Shanghai, et cetera, so some commercial companies in particular actually uses queer element to attract queer people. And this is, in a way, pretty tricky because when it comes to queer rights, they do not speak out, but they only need queer people for their money. And this is extremely problematic. And some queer people see themselves as having, in a way, better education or having better cultural capital and through which to discriminate against other groups. And this is also problematic. So this is probably also the case in the West, uh, but I would say that queerness is a complex, in a way, uh, uh, and, and contingent assemblage of discourses and imaginations and people are using them for different reasons. And for mm -hmm. our book, so we are using the term queer to embrace a kind of gender, sexual diversity and fluidity, as well as a kind, kind of anti-hegemonic politics. Oh, that's, that's really good. Two really great answers. I, I mean, I, I think even for those of us who aren't identified with LGBTQI identities, we could we can still embrace the non-hegemonic nature of queerness as you define it. I mean, it has a certain identity which you want to keep discreet, but at the same time, I think 
you're talking about something which is a, a much broader acknowledgement of the fluidity and non-categorical nature of identity, which I think is important to any discussions that we have about society and culture. So to just extend that, and um, bearing in mind what you've said, you said, you've also talked about, both of you, about challenging the idea of a hegemonic Chineseness. Now, you've already mentioned what that might mean today, but it'd be interesting to, to get you to say a little bit more about what does that mean specifically within the mainland PRC, because we can't lump the whole of the PRC into this, Hong Kong and Macau don't quite fit with that, certainly Taiwan doesn't, but certainly in the mainland. What does hegemonic Chineseness mean in that context and how does it relate to some of these questions about, let's say, heteronormativity? And can we deny Chineseness completely? It, it seems to me, you know, we're not talking about essential Chineseness, like something that's ingrained within human bodies genetically. As a as a some Chinese nationalists would claim and other nationalists would claim. But we are talking about certain ways of thinking and behavior which are historically consistent in China. And I, I, I give you an example, which is the, the often or almost always oblique resistance to authority which artists in China have to exercise which of course is historical within China. It's not just a recent thing. It's something that has gone on for hundreds of years as part of Confucian literati culture. So perhaps give us a, tell us a bit more about what hegemonic Chineseness means right now. And also whether we, whether, do you mean that we should dispense with any notion of Chineseness, any notion of difference or diversity, or are there, is there a trace structure here of continuing elements of thinking and behavior, which, which gives some sort of def definition to Chineseness in this context. So over to, to both of you. So I'll probably go first. So of course, and if you ask different artists and they all they will interpret hegemonic Chinese Chineseness in different ways. And their artwork probably speaks to different strands of Chineseness. I think that in my conversation with authors and artists, so one important thing that they are mentioning is this kind of notion of masculinity and notion of femininity. And in particular, if you know what's happening in China, in China, so the Chinese media began to censor those kind of what they call sissy boy or effeminate men uh, images, as well as uh, kind of tomboy type of femininity. So they are, they are seen as not Chinese enough or subject to Western influence. So of course, me as a person who's gender sexually non-conformative, and you, we, uh, I have great problems actually with kind of fitting into the norms of masculinity. So some schools even actually organize, organize a kind of masculinity uh, camps for, for boys to toughen themselves up. And I see that extremely pro problematic. And also I mean with a discourse of kind of marriage and giving birth to children. So at certain age, I mean, if you're in China, if you're above a, a, a 20, then everybody expects you to get married, of course, heterosexually. And then in a few years time, you'll be expected to for give, give birth to babies. And in the past, there was birth control. And now they, when the state needed uh, uh, more population, yeah. it encourages people to have second or third or even fourth mm -hmm. ch child and, and so on. So that that itself, I mean, is problematic and that kind of norms of being gender sexually normative of, of uh, producing, for example, the kind of children for the nation and uh, uh, women have to be women, have to go back home and be good mothers and wives, they are particularly problematic. And of course, the kind of resistance to these hegemonic norms doesn't have to come from the queer perspectives, but mm -hmm. it happens that in queer and feminist perspectives and discourses, I think the critique to those hegemonic discourses are particularly strong. Can I just reinforce what I think that's a fantastic answer. Just one thing I'd like to throw in there, that historically in China, 
that kind of heteronormative or that those heteronormative attitudes are strongly associated with Confucian familial culture. It's, it's, it's part of China's cultural tradition, but also that recently, and particularly under Xi Jinping, but actually a little bit before him, that those kind of values have been reinserted into China's national debate, haven't they? They're being used to reinforce a national um, sense of national uh, identity under Xi, and that he's revived Confucian ideas of the family and familial, familial piety and kind of heteronormative attitudes, which kind of explains at least to some extent, the kind of suppression of queer communities. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Do you, do you have anything to add? Yes, do, you, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yes, um, maybe just one point that I also observed um, in the art practices um, created by an artist, uh, artist group um, called, called Ergao Dance uh, Production Group. And, and Ergao is a um, choreographer and dancer. At the same time, he also kind of um, trying to um, always exploring the issues about the fluidity of the um, gender, sexuality, and also class. Um, identities in China. And I think uh, part of um, the hegemonic um, Chinese uh, narrative at the moment is that um, the country is really focusing on consumer culture. And somehow the class uh, struggles uh, narrative has become a past. So the masculine uh, Maoist woman, uh, this subjectivity, this um, part of this um, gender expression that can actually um, promote the equal right um, between the woman and man. Although this is still a binary construction of of the gender, and and still um, this is replaced by uh, the narrative that focus on the femininity, uh, feminine expressions of uh, womanhood, and at the same time, um, the narrative also kind of um, kind of um, place the workers and migrant experience um, into a marginalized uh, uh, marginalized position. And as we see in the uh, avant-garde narrative, um, the whole, sometimes homophobia, transphobia is sometimes intersect also with the bias against the uh, migrant artist group. And, and this is um, so. It's very important that we also can this, uh, acknowledge the efforts of um, the, the artists who try to um, try to use uh, queer um, queer ways of curating. Um, try to discuss um, the the. Um, the, opp uh, the oppression of these narrations, narratives, um, and try to offer a, a side of belongings to different communities, uh, engaging the migrant workers, engaging the queer people all together, and to kind of discovering what does it mean by, what, what does it mean as a Chinese self? And so I would like to actually quote from Argal that um, what uh, really inspired me is that what he say um, the the queer the identity um, it, how to say that the the is is not about identity to to have the individual individuality is not about um, reclaiming. Uh, we have individualism, but it's a, it's ability to distinguish between the nuances and to discover uh, what 
is your relationship um, with the tradition that you're orienting in. So Argao does not seem, uh, he, he does not uh, regard uh, Tai Chi as his uh, tradition, but he was noticed about the contemporary China already got the change that we have the nail lights, we have um, plastic buckets and so on, this kind of modern domesticity. It's not um, always um, disguised by the traditional uh, image, imagination of China. Fantastic answer. Look, thank you to both of you. We're, we're, obviously, we, we have limited time. I could talk about this all day. I think there's a remarkable range of issues to discuss here, and I really commend your book. I think, I think it should be widely read. But because we do have limits on time today, I'd like to pass over to Eleanor, who I'm sure has got uh, quite a few audience questions to, to, to put to our panelists. So over to you, Eleanor. Yes, thank you so much for this amazing conversation. I feel like, yeah, we're just scratching the surface here, but mm -hmm. we can all get more by reading the book. Um, we do have some great questions from the audience. And our first question is going to be from Leo. You should be able to unmute Leo. All right, can you guys hear me? All right, thank you, Eleanor. So uh, first of all, uh, very exciting. And I want to specifically sense Dai Yi to mention, like we have artists and activists all around the, uh, the globe, because I'm one of them. I used to work for an uh, organization that Professor Baum mentioned that no longer exists. And right now I'm in the US. So thank you for you both to point that out. So when I heard about this book last, uh, last month, I have this question that I post there. I I feel like this book, which is going to arrive on Tuesday, uh, going to answer this question. So I always heard people saying queer Chinese art. It's like three texts. It's queer, it's made by Chinese, it's an art. But what is exactly a queer Chinese art? And even seeing it is a mouthful, like it's three words. That's why I shortened it kuchar. You know, it means underwear, underwear in Chinese. So like me and my friends always say Kuchar. Um, but anyway, so I don't feel like, or my friends think it doesn't have a recognizable identity or identities. So that's the first comment. And second uh, is they're saying, they saw some of the documentaries or songs or whatever, they think it, it's cute. You guys tried really hard to survive. We appreciate that, but it's not good enough. One example was 2016 when, uh, the Beijing Queer Chorus came over to Denver to do the International Queer Chorus. Like everyone was about them themselves, oh, all those good words, but none of them mentioned how good their singing was. And then <laughs> later, th they're just like, we tried really hard, we feel like we're pandas. People don't treat us as respect as an artist. And that's very, like as a serious artist, that's very um, humiliating in a way. So that's my second question. I'm not an artist, but I'm wondering from you guys, point, is Kuchar good enough? So my question to you guys is to what extent you agree on, we don't have identity, we're not good enough. And if so, do we need to be having identity to be recognizable, to be good enough? And if so, what are we missing here? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. These are very good questions. So I'll uh, first say that thank you and your former colleagues at our Beijing LGBT Center have done the, work, the great work that you have done. I've visited Beijing LGBT Center a few years ago, uh, several times, and uh, I'm really indebted to all the work that you have done, and that also highlighted the importance of, for example, having a kind of historical archive. So Beijing LGBT Center used to host a community archive, and of course now it's gone. So in answer to your question, so I would refuse a fixed definition or identity for uh, queer Chinese art, exactly because any 
singular and hegemonic and uh, coherent definition would risk, uh, you know, reducing the kind of heterogeneity of the uh, uh, queer Chinese art into, into singularity. What's important is that we celebrate all those different art forms and expressions from the kind of traditional Chinese paper cutting to the kind of street activism, from film and video art to paintings and from a photograph to installations, etc. So that's the first first thing. So I think what's unite them is probably the broad understanding of queerness, the kind of anti-normativity, the kind of challenge to a hegemonic politics. So that's probably what they share. And the second question, which is, what is art? Is that art good enough? That's probably exactly what prompted me to start this project, because queer art were not visible in even in Ch contemporary Chinese art, in Chinese art history. So there are many reasons. First, people don't see queer people in art history. But if you think about that, that's really strange because in global art history and art history is full of queer people, how could queer people not visible in Chinese queer uh, history, Chinese art history? That's almost impossible. That was because of many reasons, because of historical and political and social conditions and people were not brave enough to come out. But also there were other reasons, which was that uh, many art historians actually hold up particular definition of Chinese art. Chinese art has to be this way or that way. And queer art, because it challenges all those boundaries, because it challenges the hierarchies of taste and aesthetics, and because of its non-conformity is usually seen as not artistic enough or do not conform to the conventions of traditional art, therefore evading the kind of scholarly and curatorial scrutiny. I think this is problematic. It is our hope that uh, with this book, more people start to appreciate queer Chinese art in artistic terms and also in terms of their subject matter, their aesthetics, and their politics. So being gay or lesbian or trans is probably not that important, although it underpins a lot of these positionings and expressions. I hope that I answer your question. Dee, do you have anything yeah. to add? Well, um, I agree with Hongwei, and I think uh, queer artists deserve more uh, visibility in the contemporary Chinese art history. Um, first of all, because there's some sort of uh, weird um, categorization that kind of puts uh, queer against art. What is uh, um, so? Also, um, the curator Sihan have mentioned that if you're good enough, you're you're called an artist. If you're not good enough, then you're called uh, transvestites or homosexual or or so on. You're not called an artist. So when we put this term together, we try to create a dialogue. Um, between queer Chinese and art history. And we especially would like to address how queer perspective actually have um, shaped the contemporary, the contemporary Chinese art history, uh, art making and art writing. How can we um, see our history from, um, from, from a more, um, how, how do we say it? Um, from, from a perspective that we try to uh, rethink of the categorizations uh, due to some um, norm that may not, um, that may not um, address um, certain part of the art world. 
that actually limits these uh, expressions. I think this is my answer. <laughs> Thank you so much for that great question, Leo. Um, and thanks, Hanglei and DE, for those responses. Um, our next question will be from Shin. Hi, Hanglei. Hi, DE. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me uh, to this session. And uh, I think referring to Leo's question earlier on, what you did in this book is try to translate and to, to communicate about Chinese art. And I see this book itself as a translating project. I think DE did also a lot of translation of a, a lot of uh, um, texts. Um, so I think very often those labor has been um, not um, recognized as such. And I, I'm just very impressed with all the labor you put in. And I think it's so important. And, but those things are very difficult to translate with all those cultural references um, in the artwork. So I wonder um, if you could share some experience of translating in terms of the whole book project and also translating, translation in the, for instance, on specific texts um, that this process. Dee, please. Thank you so much for your questions and um, for me, um, I actually conduct um, interviews with the artists after the workshops, and sometimes the artists uh, give some terms or I ideas, and and then um, it maybe it's not um, not very clear what do they mean by queer, for instance. The, Lisi Moore's text, maybe um, she already. Um, in her readings uh, of uh, Butler's uh, theories and and um, and she referring to identities as um, as a as a sort of the 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 uh, exp uh, polit political um, future that um, we do not need this label any anymore. And um, so I, in the beginning, because I'm also a little bit com confused when I hearing it, so I would ask uh, um, the artist to explain a little bit more about um, their, their concept, their interpretation, because I think uh, we, we uh, cannot just, um, we cannot say what is a good interpretation, what is bad interpretation, and we need to uh, encourage um, the artists just to um, express themselves, like how they explain the artworks. We respect uh, interpretation and misinterpretation and the creative usage of the theories to um, try to embody these queer concepts in the artworks and using the media medias to try to uh, illustrate these concepts and interact with the Chinese audiences. And so this is um, the procedures, uh, uh, the first stage of the procedures of, uh, of the translation. And then um, of course, I also work with uh, the, my colleagues Hong Wei and uh, Jamie, and we pass these translations, and we, uh, co we actually have several rounds of um, editing, reviewing, editing, <laughs> editing, reviewing, and then we also um, also we send back the text back to um, some of the authors just to um, make sure it explains and just to make sure this translation express the ideas. Yeah, I'll just uh, add one point, which is that in translation, of course, there are a lot of difficulties. So one difficulty is a term that relating to homosexuality. So because different artists use different terms, some use homosexual, others use queer, which is queer. And others, I mean, for example, Xia Die uses terms such as or that kind of person or this kind of person, and so on. So this is really, this is really interesting 
thing. So we do not actually impose that Western term queer onto every artist. So we pretty much translate the term they use. And if needed, we use footnotes to explain the cultural background. And include uh, some will, will refer to local terms as, uh, such as uh, uh, such as piao piao and ji lao and so on and so forth. I think that this kind of richness of language, of culture, really actually uh, manifests itself in the process of translation. And we also have kind of translators notes as well as, uh, as well as editors notes in the book to explain the context. We hope it does justice to, to, to the original text, but of course translation is always an art with a lot of regrets. I think, I think what's embedded in that, and I think it's a very significant point, is that you're really talking about the decolonization of a lot of these terms. You're not simply imposing what might be an accepted version of the term queer internationally or in Western contexts. You're, you're trying to nuance it within a particular Chinese context. I think that's a valuable contribution that I think mean, goes beyond um, discussions on art to much wider questions of culture, society, and politics in China and outside of China that perhaps our, our existing expectations around these things are not as clear cut as we think, that they're still open to debate, debate, still open to differentiation and still open to critical discussion. Thank you so much for that amazing question, Shannon. Those were really great responses. Um, our final question will be a short one um, from Chloe on behalf of Bob. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for this incredibly enlightening and brilliant conversation. I've really enjoyed every minute of it. I know we have uh, we have to turn it over to our amazing poet today, um, but I wanted to ask a brief question on behalf of Fong, our publisher and artistic director at The Rail. Fong is wondering um, whether books like Foucault's Madness and Civilization, Simone de Beauvoir's Second Sex, leading to women's rights liberation in early 70s in the US had given any sparks in the beginning of young scholars and activists across China in somewhat delayed, especially leading to in the aftermath of Tiananmen Square. Mm -hmm. Thank you, a brief answer. Yes, definitely. So especially when you are reading Li Xinmo, and I think that Li Xinmo's chapter in particular talks, talks about the influence of second and third wave feminism on her work. And some other artists, I mean, uh, also, also read Butler actually in either English or in Chinese translations. So the Chinese queer discourse should also be seen as this kind of globalized or even localized discourse where, the kind of global or Western discourses were appropriated, reappropriated, challenged and subverted. And at the same time, they're mixed with local and regional critical discourses, including China's uh, socialist feminism and the Chinese notion of Tongzhi comrade, which means gay, with a kind of particular revolutionary history. So yes, I uh, see Chinese queer discourse as a kind of hybrid discourse that is global as well as local and regional. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much for that answer. And I can't wait for Sahar's reading. I'm gonna pass it over to Eleanor. Yeah, thank you, Chloe, and thanks, Fong, for that great question. Um, and again, thank you, DE and and Paul for this amazing conversation that has been so luminous today. Um, we do always love to conclude our community events with a poetry reading. And today I'm so thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Sahar Kraibani to the stage. Sahar is a writer, artist, and associate professor at Pratt Institute. Born and raised in Beirut, Sahar is currently based in Brooklyn and writes about the intersection of art and geopolitics, cyber landscapes, desire, and the digital reproductibility of trauma. Sahar's writing has appeared in the Brooklyn Rail among many other publications, and Sahar is the recipient of the Montez Press Writers Grant in 2020. Thank you so much for being here, Sahar, and over to you. 
Thank you all so much. That was such a great conversation. Um, thank you for doing all that work. And I'm really excited to check out the book. Um, I'm going to read, I think, three poems today. Um, they're part of a forthcoming collection and they deal with some, you know, um, intersection of identity, queerness, geopolitics, and um, some of the themes that were talked about today. Um, so the, the first poem that I'm reading is a poem of redaction based on Permanent Trespass, which was a performance that took place in Beirut in 2021. Um, the performance was about the connection between the Balkans and Beirut insofar as the histories of war and violence. So the following is a redacted version of um, the dialogue, which lends it new meaning. Omissions after permanent trespass. Eulogy presupposes continuity. Those who remain clearing their throats, discrete phases of time, separate calendars, confused for one another. 12 years, overthrow, ideals, 18 days, the commune's life, tragically well-kept, apocalyptic, their time is that of the final instance. Tragic, re tragic realists, tragedy is a genre, a taking note of the movement of fate. Eulogy, the time of authority, the only time. I don't know when spring ended and I don't know when summer began. There are two, only two seasons now. Somewhere in the world, a season of peace. The second poem I'm reading is part of a larger project called Escape Attempts. And it's about navigating um, existing as an immigrant and immigrating to the United States and just that experience of um, having your movements be kind of dictated by the state. Estate, escape attempt number one. Salty sweat I lick until I'm parched. I lay down, I ask for weight, I surrender. Being a lover is accepting defeat, an attempt to understand pleasure gaps. A plane to a bus and you're there in the car. We cross the border at night. We enter my periphery and your center. You say, I can't do this any longer. You look away. I am intent on arriving. Every return, a well-rehearsed plan. This time, I'm tired. We can't argue. To extend this hand is its own kind of defeat. To say that I'm susceptible to sorrow. To attach as a way of dismantling. I let you lead the way. I lick until I'm done for. I do the work. To understand what, to understand what one can only intuit about a gap the short circuit between two arenas. We are most surveilled where we believe ourselves most free. Departures are never easy, but they're always the same. Desire is a form of complicity, yielding into contact, the erotics of rupture. Color comes into vision without invitation, living and decay, the same sort of unwelcome. My vision frays at the edges and I have to squint. Even utopia retains a bit of occupation. Um, this next poem I'm reading is um, just a, kind of a um, like a train of thought. So it's just in the form of a block. Psychosomatic something. We leave the house at one in the morning, not knowing where the night will take us. Somewhere under the Kujusko Bridge, there's an abandoned skate park. I fear the end at the precipice of a beginning, your final resting place the side of a highway. You were told it would be pretty, the topology of flesh time folding, a loose approximation, the aversion to being happy. You say, I'm tired of city life, but we know no other life. Something so sad about getting over it. You're too tired to make subtle pleas for me to stay. The lack of resistance makes this departure somehow harder. Still, every morning, same presence, same rooms. In bed, watching the clouds moving away from the outline of the building, an incapacity to disconnect from, alternating forms of instant gratification, habits I've acquired from past lovers, 
the sluggish quality of an afternoon so reminiscent of sunny days spent indoors. The indoors are addictive, still wearing the same hoodie, still the same, still wearing the, safe, the silk pants. I am living with ghosts, morphing spaces of alliances and formation. Then both the alibi and the consequence, both the contingency and the lack of, both the reason and the avoidance, been up, been 3 a.m., been music sputtering out from blood, been on the phone and off, been the giver and the receiver, been pleasure and its lack. It is a manner of life burial. You are that shadow, but there's no one left to say so. Your language was unique, resisted its extension into other mouths. The body's primitive refusal of what it knows to be an injustice. A body is never present for itself, for what it is. We trade feelings like loose change. Some things cannot be approximated, but picked up from dance floors. And um, the last poem I read is called The Home You Built in Me and Other Ways I Failed at Documentation. On any given day, everything I love is a symbol. Exploration made data, made flesh. The land does what it does on the brick, on the skin, on the land, approximating distance. Teardrops sway the earth's gravity. A home is sometimes a pool, many sink to the bottom. Lower decks reserved for the darkest, the most least, every, everything, skin, bruised knees, I wipe and clean dirt from the fall. You're busy texting and then you run, skin me, you say, when are you going to wear your knee pads, boy? Will the afterlife be this hierarchical? Will I need my knee pads, elbow brace? Blood has its favorites, memes as coping mechanism. What a dramatic irony, as in tragic, as in you have more faith in a pixel than most politicians, people, things. This is mercy as clinical approach. This is time when it comes. This is the luxury of a thermostat. This is a rotation of visitors that renders language redundant. This is what cannot be written. Some days futurity feels impossible, continuous existence. You point at the bank thinking it's a masjid and I can't see beyond a thumbprint. Everyone I love is scratching on things they can't disavow. I don't return calls. Everyone I love is scavenging, picking at whatever is left behind. Thank you all so much for listening. That was so, so, so beautiful. Thank you, Sahar. Thank you so much. That was incredible. Such a perfect way to conclude this conversation. And thanks again, of course, to Hungwei, DE, and Paul. We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC program and making these daily conversations possible and for their support of our growing archive, which you can check out on our YouTube channel. For the past 22 years, the Rook and the Braille has been a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our monthly publication and public events like our daily NSC. Please check the chat for a link to donate to support the rail. And join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Thaddeus Mosley and John Yao on the event of recent sculpture at Karma Gallery in Los Angeles. We conclude with a poetry reading by Marquis. And you all can now turn on your microphones for a moment and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So Thank you. Yeah. Thank Good you. Good job, Tai. That was Bye -bye. so Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, you guys. <laughs>